One thing that used to confuse me when I was a young lad <laughs> coming up through the trades is what is a feeder and what is a service entrance conductor? What's the difference between them? Because a lot of times you'll see in the code book feeders and service entrance conductors, they're like side by side in a lot of parts of code or like something that will apply to a feeder will also apply to a service entrance conductor. So I was like, what is that? So I figured we should go through, uh, open up your code books. Please open up your code books. If you're watching this anyways, just open up the code books. I'll actually teach you some things. Um, all right, if you go into chapter one, article 100, where all the definitions are, uh, we have the definition of feeder. And for a feeder, it says all circuit conductors between the service equipment, the source of a separately derived system or other power supply source and the final branch circuit over current device. So that means that any conductors that are you know, from the service, not the meter encoded also defines that the service is not the meter. The service is the main disconnect. The first disconnecting means of a, a premises wire, wiring system. So from that first disconnecting means leaving there and going to, let's say like another panel and going to a main breaker inside of that panel. That whole thing is a feeder. It's feeding something. It's not entering the service. So a service entrance conductor, um, I, I bet it has something to do with entering the service. <laughs> uh, we have two different definitions. One is overhead and one is underground because there's two different types of electrical services. Um, so let's just read the overhead. The service conductors between the terminals of the service equipment, where we were just talking about that main disconnect, and a point usually outside of the building, clear of building walls where joined by tap or splice to the service drop or overhead service conductor. So basically, if you look at the, the main service disconnecting means, the stuff coming into the service from the utility, that's your service entrance conductors. The stuff leaving the service, leaving that main disconnect, going to another thing, another load, that is a feeder, but it's usually between a breaker and another breaker. So if you have say like a uh, transformer, right? Where we've got feeders that leave that main disconnect and they go into a uh, another disconnect and then they go down and do a transformer and then they leave the transformer and they go over to another panel to the main breaker of that panel, that all of that is still a feeder. The whole thing through the transformer, everything, they're still considered feeders. So it's kind of a weird word and that's why it's a little bit ambiguous with the definition. But just remember that you're talking about uh, anything prior to the main disconnect or after the main disconnect. Does electrical work have to be neat or pretty or does it just have to be done to code? So we're going to be going to 110.12. It says electrical equipment shall be installed in a neat and workmanlike manner. So there's three sections within that, but just that alone, what does that even mean? What is a workman? Workman, a man employed or skilled in some form of manual, mechanical, or industrial work. So employed or skilled. So if you have a skill in something, what does it even mean to be skilled? Having or showing skill, expert, or proficiency. Requiring specialized ability or training. So as an electrician, I am trained to do work by the people that I'm around and whatever standard to the, whatever they do work by, that is all I know really until I get out there and start seeing more people and more experiences. Um, so it's not really saying like you have to do things pretty and aesthetically because pretty and aesthetically is a very, very relative term. But the term neat and workmanlike is specific in code. So to install electrical equipment, just to the minimums, not going over crazy, making sure all your Roman is stapled perfectly to me that's neat and workmanlike but some people just stapling it per code and who gives a shit what it looks like it's getting covered up at the wall that's also neat and workmanlike right uh, the neat is the part that i think we should look at so the definition of neat means free from dirt and disorder habitually clean and orderly it kind of seems like free from dirt and disorder means like if you make a mess, clean up your mess. It doesn't mean do everything evenly and perfectly and neatly and straight. It says marked by skill or ingenuity or precise and systematic. So there does kind of have this little bit of element of rather than just being somebody throwing shit up on a wall, you install it, you know, thinking about it orderly and systematically and cleaning it when you're done. And that's what professionalism is. So 
That's really all it says. Uh, under the 110.12 mecha mechanical execution at work, there's three different sections. There's A, B, and C. So it goes kind of more specifically for these three things. One of them is unused openings. And it says unused openings other than those intended for the operation of the equipment, those intended for mounting purposes, and those permitted as part of the design for listed equipment shall be closed to afford protection substantially equipment to the wall of the equipment. Where metallic plugs or plates are used with non-metallic enclosures, they shall be recessed at least one quarter inch from the outer surface of the enclosure. So that's specifically for unused openings. So they're saying it's not neat and workmanlike if you leave openings in enclosures. Then we have the integrity of the electrical equipment and connections. Internal parts of electrical equipment, including bus bars, wire terminals, insulators, and other surfaces shall not be damaged or contaminated by foreign materials such as paint, plaster, cleaners, abrasives, or corrosive residues. So again, kind of just clean installs, not messy installs is what they're getting at. There shall be no damaged parts. This is another one you see a lot of times. Somebody like shorts out a receptacle and they blow up that terminal, but it's like, I'm just gonna shove it in the wall. That's not neat and workmanlike according to this for the integrity of the, the equipment. You can't damage stuff. There shall be no damage parts that may adversely affect the safe operation or mechanical strength of the equipment, such as parts that are broken. So maybe that's a little relative because if it's not interfering with the safe operation, but it's damaged, it's really aesthetic damage. So it's not uh, the integrity of the electrical equipment. Another kind of relative thing there. And then we go on to cables and conductors. So cables and conductors installed exposed on the surfaces of ceilings and sidewalls shall be supported by the building structure in such a manner that the cables and conductors will not be damaged by normal building use. So it goes a little bit more in depth on that. But those are the three kind of cases that the NEC is, is really specific about. Even though it's kind of vague what it means, they just give us a little bit more information. <laughs>is in the 400s under 408 panel boards. Part three is specifically for panel boards. So if you're looking through here, there's a whole bunch of other, uh, like part two is switch boards and switch gear, a little bit different, similar kind of things, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking specifically about panel boards. Um, and in 408.36 under overcurrent protection, it says in addition to the requirement of 408.30, a panel board shall be protected by an overcurrent protective device having a rating not greater than that of the panel board. So if you have a 200 amp panel board, you can't put, you know, like a 400 amp breaker in it or something like that. This overcurrent protective device shall be located within or at any point on the supply side of the panel board. Um, so the supply side of the panel board would be where the lugs come in. So you could either have the overcurrent protection there or somewhere upstream as long as it is on, it is on the supply side. The next thing I think is good to look at is uh, in 225, outside branch circuits and feeders. So in situations where we are running a feeder from one structure to another structure, there might be a time where you have to put a breaker at another structure versus making somebody like leave a building or structure and go walk to another building just to be able to turn a breaker off. So let's see what it says about that. Uh, part two is going to be buildings or other structures supplied by feeders or branch circuits. So buildings or other structures, a structure could be like a sign. You know, it's not just an actual building, but signs also, if you have a feeder or a branch circuit that is going to some kind of other building or structure, this is what the code specifies in there. Uh, specifically under 225.31, we're looking at disconnecting means. So it just says a means shall be provided for disconnecting all ungrounded conductors that supply or pass through the building or structure. So at a building or structure, if you have conductors that enter it, you need to have a disconnecting means. So in this case, what we could do is we could have a main breaker panel at the first building, or we could have like a big disconnect over at that other building and then feed with feeders or with a branch circuit into this structure. But we have to put some kind of disconnecting means. So a lot of times what you'll do is in a, a commercial environment, you'll just put another panel, you know, an entirely new panel board and you could put an MLO 
panel there as long as you have some kind of means of disconnecting it or you could put an MBR panel there with the breaker already in it and that would serve as your disconnecting means. <laughs> Thank you.